Hi. Uh, I'd like to today give a brief history and overview of a, of a difficult topic, uh, but an essential topic, a very important idea in Christian theology, the doctrine of the Trinity. It's, of course, an idea which is intimidating to many Christians, very much misunderstood um, generally. Um, but as I say, it's an idea of critical importance. And the reason it's so important is it's really central to the gospel message. It's central to the message of Jesus Christ and the person who he revealed himself to be. Um, can this be done briefly? I think it can, and I think it's actually helpful to do it briefly, to actually walk through in very large strides the history of the development of the doctrine and what the Bible has to say about it, and try to understand it perhaps in one quick sitting. That gives us a basis for contemplating God and thinking about him more deeply, worshiping him and uh, growing in our fellowship with him uh, by, again, having an outline, a sort of skeleton form of the doctrine of the Trinity uh, for our worship and, uh, and for our understanding of Scripture. So as we read what the apostles say about Jesus, when we read uh, what the prophets say about who God is, uh, we have a better understanding of what we're reading and what we're seeing. So uh, in order to do that, I have a, uh, a graphic which I think is instructive and I hope is instructive. Uh, and what it does is it, uh, it's got three sides, it's a triangle, and it <clears throat> gives three uh, basic ideas around the sides of the triangle uh, upon which the doctrine of the Trinity is founded. Uh, of course, the word Trinity isn't anywhere in the Bible. It came later uh, through an early church father by the name of Tertullian. He uh, introduced this, this term Trinitas, uh, meaning three and one at the same time in some sense, to describe the Christian view of God. This idea comes again from three, what we might call sub-doctrines or sub-ideas of the Trinity. And they are this. Uh, on the left side of the triangle, we see that there's clearly, and uh, the, the prophets are clear about this, the apostles are clear about this, uh, it's unambiguous in scripture, there's one and only one God. There are not multiple gods. Um, scripture doesn't teach polytheism. Christians have never worshiped um, in a polytheistic way or not, ought not to have. Uh, worshipped in that way. And so uh, how many gods are there according to scripture, according to Christian theology? There's one and only one God. Uh, the second uh, side that we'll look at, the bottom side, indicates now something odd about this one God. This one God is simultaneously known uh, through three persons. We use this term persons in Christian theology. The first person that we know to be God is the Father. Jesus comes preaching and teaching about his Father who is in heaven. Everyone knows he's talking about the God of Israel. There's, again, no ambiguity there. When he comes out and speaks of his Father, John 5, he's speaking of his Father and God interchangeably, and people say, wait, you're saying God is not just our Father, but your Father, right? Your Father, this is the God of Israel. This is the great God and creator of the whole universe. Everyone knew, again, that Jesus was talking about, about God when he was speaking of the Father. But then, the apostles go on to speak about Jesus in ways that indicate that he's just as divine as the Father. In fact, again, in John 5, people realize that when Jesus was saying, God is my Father, that he was actually making a claim to be equal with God. Because if my son points at me and says, that's my Father, right? He's indicating not only a privileged relationship with me, but something which doesn't need to be said. I'm the same species as him because I'm literally his Father. And so humans beget humans, a divine father would beget a divine being. Remember, the son is begotten, according to the biblical language, not created, but begotten. He comes from the father, from the very bosom of the father. He is the light or radiance of the father, John chapter 1 says. And so he comes forth from the father, Christian theology says, being of the same substance as the father. And so that's one indication. There's all sorts of indications, of course, that Jesus is just as divine as the father. Um, He's given divine names and titles and prerogatives. Um, he's called Savior. God, through Isaiah, says, I'm the only Savior, there is no other. Um, Paul, in Colossians 1, says that Jesus Christ is the creator of all things. Well, the creator of all things, of course, is God. So he has divine names. He does divine things. He says, if anyone asks of me, if anyone prays to me, I will answer, right? And so he claims to answer prayer. He forgives sins and these sorts of things. And so he does divine things. He has divine names. 
Um, he is the fullness of deity and bodily form, uh, Colossians says. He's the exact representation of the Father. Jesus actually says this. This is audacious. If he were a mere prophet, no mere prophet would say this. He says, just as you believe in God, believe also in me. Of course, your pastor can't say something like that. Just as you have faith in God, have faith in me. No human has the right to say such a thing. But Jesus says this. He says, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. His disciples are asking him, okay, if you just show us God, we would believe. Just show us God, as if aliens imagined abducted you and said, well, if we could just see a human, we would understand what humans are like. Just show us a human. Well, you would say to those aliens, if you're trying to help them, well, just look at me. I'm a human. So if you look at me, you see what humans are, right? At least in part. Jesus says, when you've seen me, you've seen everything that God is. Um, and so the Father is God, the Son is God, and then, of course, the Holy Spirit is God. How do we know this? Jesus, from John 16 and forward and various other places, he says that, the Holy Spirit is another helper that he would send to carry on God's mission of salvation in the world. No one else has the power or authority to carry on God's mission of salvation than God. Again, God is the only Savior. There is no other. But yet Jesus says, I will send another. It's not me coming back in another form. Otherwise, Jesus is a liar. It's not me coming back as wind or fire. It's another. It's the Holy Spirit. In Acts 5, Peter, when he's... Um, rebuking Ananias and Sapphira for lying about selling all of their goods uh, and then trying to take credit for being so uh, charitable and all of this. He realizes that they lied. They didn't give away all of their money. They claimed to. And he said, you haven't lied to men, but rather you've lied to God. You've lied to the Holy Spirit. He uses the names God and Holy Spirit interchangeably. And of course, the Holy Spirit is not a mere force or power. The Holy Spirit guides, leads, teaches the church, is grieved by sin. These are personal properties. And so the Holy Spirit is personal, not an it, but a who, in fact, a he, and a divine he. So Christians have taught that the Father is God, the Son is God, and that the Spirit is God. But yet, that third side, the Father, Son, and Spirit are not the same person. So when Jesus says to his disciples, I'm going to pray to my Father, he's not lying to them. He's not going off to speak to himself or you know, mumble to himself for a little bit. When he says, I'm sending another, he's not coming back again as wind or tongues of fire. At Jesus' baptism, John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. The Father speaks from heaven, and a voice is heard coming from heaven, and the Spirit descends as if a dove. Uh, that indicates the individuation of the Father, Son, and Spirit. They're, in some sense, not the same, again, person, although there is one and only one God. So how do we believe all three of those things at the same time? It's hard to do. That's the task of Trinitarian theology, which leads us to worship of God, which really is, in many ways, beyond our intellectual grasp. That's why we say that the doctrine of the Trinity is a mystery, but Christians have to affirm it because, again, it's what prophets and apostles and ultimately Jesus himself taught about who God is. So how can we go about understanding it? There are three defective ways of trying to grasp it, and we've seen in the history of Christian theology these three defective ways have always sort of come back and been recycled. We call these heresies, and uh, a heresy means it is near to Christian belief. It is near to affirming the, uh, the things that prophets and apostles taught, but in some ways it leaves something out, it destroys some truth, it undermines uh, scripture in some way. And so the three ways to do this are to affirm two of the sides and deny the third. If you affirm two of the sides and then deny the third, you come up with something that makes a good bit of sense. The problem is you've denied a significant teaching of scripture, and so no Christian should obviously do such a thing. The first way to go is to say, Scripture is unambiguous. Hardly anybody has ever called themselves a Christian and said, you know what, I think there's more than one God. So we affirm that there's one God. That's obvious. That's easy. And we have a straightforward reading of Scripture that the Father, Son, and Spirit are, again, not the same thing in some sense. They interact with one another. The Son prays to the Father and speaks to the Father, sends the Spirit. The Son is sent by the Father. So there's, some, again, some individuation of the two. So if you hold these two things together, but maybe reject the deity of the persons, you move away from the full deity of the Son and Spirit, you move up to that upper part of the triangle, let's say you exit the triangle at the top, that's called Arianism. And this comes from an ancient um, figure in the church in the early fourth century by the name of Arius, who taught this. He said that the Father alone is truly God. So it's not true that the Father, Son, and Spirit are all the one God. Only the Father is truly God only the Father. The Son is a creature, someone created, a great angel. 
that God uses in saving the world, but not the creator himself. So John 1 doesn't make a whole lot of sense in light of this. Um, Colossians 1, in which we see that Jesus the creator doesn't make a whole lot of sense in light of this. That's what Arius taught. Well, we can't affirm that because we know, as we read scripture, that Jesus has all of the prerogatives and names and powers and authority of God. And so we have to move away from that. Another way to go would be this. It would be to say that, of course, there is one God, and the Father, Son, and Spirit are that one God, but they're not really individuals. Uh, and that would be to move to the lower left-hand uh, part of the triangle, or to exit the triangle in the lower left. That's called modalism. And so that is to say that the Father, Son, and Spirit are just three roles. Um, I might say that I play at least three roles. I'm a husband, and so I speak and act with my wife in one way, and only a way that's appropriate to her. And then I'm a father, I speak and act with my children in a way that's appropriate to them. And then I'm also a professor, I speak and act with my students in a way that's appropriate to them. And there might be some similarities between how I treat um, these three different constituencies, but there's obviously distinct differences. And I have one personality, just very naturally, with how I am with my wife, and another personality with my children, and a third personality with my students. And so you might say that I'm three different people, although I'm one person, I have three different roles that I play in my life, and God is something like that. Well, again, that makes nonsense of Jesus' clear teachings, um, makes Jesus out to be a liar, um, and the Father out to be a liar. It doesn't take account of the real individuation of the persons. The third way to go, which hardly anyone has ever done until the advent of Mormonism in the 1830s, there have been no people who said, we are Christians and we think there's more than one God uh, in the history of the church, for the most part, but you might do that. You might say that the Father, Son, and Spirit are individuals, and they're all three gods, but there's not one God. There's one species of gods. And in fact, the Father, Son, and Spirit are three distinct gods. And that would be, of course, polytheism, or what we would call tritheism. Well, those are three kind of cogent ways of going, ways that make sense of things. How can we try to stay in the center and contemplate God and worship God as Scripture instructs us to? Because we don't want any of those three options. There are a couple uh, good ways of doing that that the early church fathers pointed out. Uh, let me just speak about one of them, and that would be to do theology down in this lower right-hand area. Uh, if you notice in the triangle, there are three subcircles, and those three subcircles are biblical ways of thinking about God, but somewhat different ways of thinking about God, all of which work, all of which are good, all of which are what we would call orthodox. Um, and have been proposed by Bible-believing Christians, and uh, Bible-believing Christians see the usefulness of, of this, and there are at least three useful ways of thinking about God as a Christian, all of which, again, overlap and are related, but emphasize somewhat different things. If we do theology down in that lower right section, we would really emphasize, just like a tritheist, the full deity of the Father, Son, and Spirit, and the individuation of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, how do we also then coherently say that there's one and only one God and not affirm that there's more than three gods. In the early church, in the late fourth century, well after Arius, was a group of theologians by the name of the Cappadocian Fathers. And they suggested this model. Um, Gregory of Nyssa said, imagine a pool of gold, pool of molten gold, and three statues sort of magically emerging out of the, the pool of molten gold, three human figures coming apart and the gold flows through them. Now, how many golds are there? You wouldn't ask how many golds are there. There's one pool of gold, and so there's one divinity. There's one omnipotent being, one omniscient being, one perfectly good being, one holy being, and that being, that divinity flows through them, but there's a sort of distinction, and they sort of come apart and then blend back together. Or Gregory Nazianzen, another Cappadocian father, says, imagine three torches coming together and forming one light. Um, a useful analogy today, especially for you youth ministers, some people don't like this, but it actually works. There's a toy now called the fidget spinner. I wish I had one with me. Uh, the fidget spinner, if you can imagine, it's a three-sided toy that spins in the middle, and it's got three nodes. And as you spin it, what happens is when you add the motion to the three sides, they blend together. And you can't tell where one begins and another one ends. They are distinct. They're individuals, but they blend into one thing. That's the idea that the Cappadocians had in mind. And so there's an overlapping and interweaving. And in fact, there's some biblical legs to this too. Jesus says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. It's as if they move into one another, again, sharing the same being. 
Jesus in John 20, he actually breathes on his disciples and says, receive my Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes out of him. It's as if the Son contains the Father and, and Spirit, and the Father contains the Son and Spirit. The Son proceeds from the Father. The Spirit is the Spirit of God, and even the Spirit contains the Father and Son. Jesus says, if anyone loves me, I will love him, and my Father will love him, and we will come into him. Well, how does the Holy Spirit, or rather, how do the Father and Son come into the believer by means of the Holy Spirit? So it's as if they mutually contain one another and blend into each other. And so that's a useful analogy in a useful way. And these are all analogies, and they just help us to begin thinking about God. Unfortunately, we can never get to a final word on exactly and precisely, in a clear scientific sense, um, what God's nature is. But what it does is it leads us to more worship. It saves us from affirming any overt contradiction. And it helps us to have a much bigger view of God um, than than we might imagine we can have and our souls grow and as our souls grow we're more filled with his presence and knowledge of him and it's really something that we're going to be spending all of eternity um, contemplating and coming to know more deeply and uh, again coming to worship God more fully uh, through the revelation of the, of the doctrine of the Trinity.